Rabbi Elliot Schreier is the senior rabbi of Congregation B'nai Yeshurun, the largest Orthodox synagogue in Teaneck, New Jersey, boasting six different minyanim on any given Shabbos morning. But despite its size, Rabbi Schreier still makes the time to connect with each of his members personally through his daily routine of touch points. I call people on their yard sites. I call people on their yard sites. It's, um, it's incredibly time consuming. I have a very large shul, but it, those small conversations, you, you learn so much and, and you forge a relationship through them. And oh. you're doing all of those other things, you're able to connect with them in the drusha in a more meaningful way as well. Early into his career, Rabbi Schreier had the privilege of being mentored by one of the great darshanim of our generation, Rabbi Kenneth Hain, senior rabbi of Beth Shalom in Lawrence, New York. One thing that, that Rabbi Hain mastered better than any rabbi, any other rabbi I've ever witnessed, is the way in which a drusha is a tool of connection. This mindset, seeing the drusha as a means of connection between rabbi and kahila, influences all aspects of how Rabbi Schreier crafts and delivers his drushas. This includes how he structures the drusha. But I certainly find that in my best drushas that I'm always starting with that almost like personal opening where I'm just talking one-on-one -on -one to hundreds of congregants. And foregoing the use of notes. But when I'm giving a drusha, I almost never use notes because when I'm giving a drusha, I want to be connecting with my people. And in order to connect, you need to be talking to them, not talking at them. If you're a speaker who's looking to better connect to your audience through your presentation, then this episode is for you. It's jam packed with lots of useful strategies and techniques that you'll want to put into practice right away, like tips for making your drusha more personable and relatable. Let's say there's a Dvar Torah that I want to share or, or a study that I read that I want to share. Instead of just jumping into the study and saying, oh, in uh, 1964, so-and-so said this, or in this week's Parsha, the Ramban comments as follows. I'll just talk about the way I came across the source. Uh, it was late this week. I was speaking with an old Chavrusa of mine. I haven't spoken to him in many years. It was really nice to catch up. And he sent me this source that I was really struck by. It's like, that's totally all irrelevant information. And, and it's a means of forging a connection. How to ensure your speaking style is appropriate to the room. If you have a small intimate crowd and you start getting up and delivering this bombastic drusha as if you are, you know, Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb himself, and you start, you start with this very formal style and it just, there's a mismatch between the atmosphere that you're in and the style of drusha that you're given. And an ingenious way of structuring your drusha to retain your audience's attention all the way through. I will deliberately put those pieces interspersed between my Torah messages or something like that. But sometimes it creates what I call a snapback moment. When you've lost some of your crowd, you have a snapback moment where you're delivering a Torah idea, and then you'll say, you know, I saw an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal the other week, and all of a sudden, you'll have a bunch of people who are, who are not attentive, and they hear that, and all of a sudden, they're, they're back to attention. I learned so much from my interview with Rabbi Elliot Schreier, and I'm sure you will too. So now, without further ado, here's my conversation with Rabbi Elliot Schreier. Good morning. Hi, Shalom Aleichem. It's good to be spending the time together. You, you made my job a little bit easier because you have a Wikipedia page <laughs> about you. <laughs> I don't know who made that. It was not me. I have nothing to do with it, and I don't take any responsibility for it. But yeah, and I learned that um, that you were the rabbi at uh, in, at uh, Albert Einstein uh, beforehand. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had interviewed Rabbi Kalman Top. Is he was he he was a the rabbi there? Is that the same? Rabbi Kalman Top was one of my Einstein predecessors. What's interesting about the position in Einstein is that it's a very transient rabbinic position because the community is constantly shifting. The community, it's a meta, it's the shuls in a medical school. So you have total turnover every four years virtually. You have the one or two MD PhD students who stay for six or seven years, which is like unheard of. They're, they're the, uh, you know, the elders of the community. But you have rabbinic turnover also every four or five years. I was there for five years. Um, and Rabbi Top was there um, a while before me. He was, I think, the fourth or fifth Einstein rabbi. I was the ninth Einstein rabbi. Um, and then when he left Einstein, he became the assistant rabbi in the Young Israel of Woodmere, mm -hmm. where I was growing up at the time. So I actually grew up listening to Rabbi Top's drushos. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So it's a multifaceted relationship. He, I mean, I grew up with him as my rav. And later I became his successor, I guess, in some sense, in Einstein. And we developed a rabbinic relationship through that as well. Uh-huh. So you grew up listening to his drushas. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So, so tell me, is there anything specific that you took away from him that you still uh, incorporate either maybe consciously or unconsciously? So I was very, I was very young when I was listening to Rabbi Top. I didn't have the same ear, sensitive ear and trained ear that I have nowadays. Nowadays, whenever I listen to another rabbi, I'm always listening on two levels. I'm listening just as an audience member to hear the content the way everybody else does. And I'm also listening as a professional to see, oh, that turn of phrase they use, that technique they use there. So, but now I'm always listening on, on two planes whenever I hear um, anyone speak, really, but particularly when I hear Rabbanim speak. Back then, I was, I was really listening on, on one plane only. Um, as a sorry? As a, as a consumer. Yeah, as a consumer, exactly. Um, yeah. My top was always one thing that I do remember, again, I was young at the time, but he was always very polished in his presentation. That's something that I always strive to do as well. You, you'd, it seems silly, but you can really have an impact just based on having a presentation that flows, that is eloquent, that that appreciates the nuances of language. A lot of people will overtly appreciate the nuances of language, and a lot of people don't overtly appreciate it. They can't articulate to you what it is that you said or how you said it that they appreciate. But when you have, you could say the same thing content-wise, but when you say it in a way that is um, sophisticated and sometimes just meaningful in a way that's not necessarily sophisticated, but in a way that resonant resonates when you approach it the right way, when you craft it the right way, the same exact message can have a whole new level of impact. And the right top was always very eloquent in that regard. He was always very polished, very articulate. He, he has like, this is not something that I incorporate personally, but he always started with a joke that was like always his style. I don't know if he does that still, but certainly in those years, he would always open with a joke and people came to expect that and appreciate it. Um, but certainly his um, his just eloquence and his the the way in which through a little wordsmithing and through a little crafting, you could really have a wholly different level of impact. That's something that I definitely uh, think about a lot today as well. Yeah. So, so where, where did you, when you began your speaking career as, as a Rav, you were an assistant rabbi and, and, and then a rabbi and then an, another rabbi in a different place. Where, where did you, did you take homiletics? Did you take public speaking? Uh, where did you go for, for uh, direction? Right. So I, I definitely had public speaking courses through my REITs training and things like that. But I'd say formative training didn't really happen within a classroom or a lecture hall, really in the field. I started in Congregation Beth Shalom. I was a rabbinic intern there, and I worked there for Rabbi Kenny Hain. So Rabbi Hain is one of the masters, one of the, uh, he's really one of the uh, the celebrated veterans of the world. And I, I really learned a lot from, not even overt instruction, just from observing him, watching what he does, thinking about what he does. Um, and much of what I learned from him, I continue to incorporate. I'd say that, if there's one thing or meta theme, if you will, that, that I learned from Rabbi Hain more than anything else, and I could talk about some of the ways in which this manifests in terms of actually delivering drushos, but one thing that, that Rabbi Hain mastered better than any rabbi, any other rabbi I've ever witnessed, is the way in which a drusha is a tool of connection. It's a means towards connection. When rabbis think about what we're trying to do in a drusha, we think about inspiring people. That's certainly an important part of what we do. We try to inspire them to grow and to uh, to strive, to create aspirations, to achieve, etc. Uh, we're looking to teach, of course. There needs to be some Torah content. For some people, that's, that's the only Torah that they're really getting from their rabbi over the course of the week. So we're looking to teach as well. But Rabbi Hain highlighted to me, and maybe this is intuitive to other Smicha students, but it certainly was not intuitive to me when, when I was a young rabbi that there is a third component of the drusha as well that's just as critical as all the others. And that is connecting. It's a means for the rabbi to connect with his congregants because in this profession, all the growth that you aspire to uh, inspire in others, all the, all the goals that you set for yourself, it's all rooted in the relationships and in the connections that you have. And if you lack those connections, you're not going to succeed in achieving any of those loftier, broader goals. And for Rabbi Hain, the drusha was one of his most powerful tools with connecting with his congregants. And that manifested on a whole host of different levels. I'll give you some examples. So yeah. one is the question of like openers. Rabbis love talking about openers for your drusha. What's the opening style, right? What do you use for an opener, et cetera? And there's kind of like a formula nowadays. They talk about the rabbi from yesteryear who would open up within this week's parsha and how 
You're not supposed to do that. Although I think nowadays in certain circumstances, it's more effective to do that than opening up with, with a canned opening. Um, but you want to intrigue. There's, there's talk about the hook and things like that. So I can tell you that in my most effective drushos, none of that is really on my mind. That's, that's not really what I'm looking to do in my opener. When Rabbi Hain opened up a drusha, you felt like you were talking to him around his dining room table. It felt like a conversation. He'd open up in a way that was so natural that, again, he could have just been talking directly to you and telling you just a story about something that happened in his life. And later on, he'd build up to his rhetorical crescendo. I don't know if you've ever heard Rabbi Haim, but he has this deep, booming voice. Um, and he'd, he'd develop the, the, the classic rhetorical style, or, or he'd, he'd kind of ease into that, that rhetorical moment when you're, you're the rabbi as speaker. But at the outset, he was the rabbi who was just talking to you. And I always found that very powerful and very engaging. Number one, it's much more natural than, than I'd say a more canned hook or something like that. It's a much more natural way of easing into things. And number two, in terms of that connection piece, you really felt connected to him because it, it was a drusha to an entire audience. But stylistically, in terms of tone, he, he could have been talking to you personally in a personal conversation. And, and I'll try to do that as well. It's hard to do that every single week. One of the challenges of, of giving dress shows is that it's a weekly performance. You finish one and you're already on to the next one. So it's hard to do that on a weekly basis. But I certainly find that in my best dress shows that I'm always starting with that almost like personal opening where I'm just talking one-on-one -on -one to hundreds of congregants simultaneously. I'll sometimes, I mean, I'll confess openly for on, the, on this podcast I'll sometimes even artificially construct ways of doing that, uh, almost artificially. If I will, let's say there's a Dvar Torah that I want to share or, or a study that I read that I want to share. Instead of just jumping into the study and saying, oh, in uh, 1964, so-and-so said this, or in this week's Parsha, the Ramban comments as follows. I'll just talk about the way I came across the source. Uh, it was late this week. I was speaking with an old Chavrusa of mine. I haven't spoken to him in many years. It was really nice to catch up. And he sent me this source that I was really struck by. It's like, that's totally all irrelevant information, but it's a way of just contextualizing it, humanizing it. It's not just this sterile source that, that the rabbi is reading off of a page. The rabbi is sharing with you his process for how he came about it. I'll share how it impacted me, why it resonated with me, um, and things like that. It just becomes much more real, and, and it's a means of forging a connection. Another thing that, that I always try to do, and again, I also got this from, from Rabbi Hain as well, is the inclusion of personal elements within a drasha. When I was an intern, I'd give a drasha that I thought was just totally masterful. And afterwards, um, Rabbi Hain would ask me, why is this drasha a drasha that no one else could give? Or in other words, he would say, your drasha was very nice, but any rabbi could have given that. And, and in this global world that we live in, they could have downloaded it from the internet too. It, it was nice, but... Where, why was it your drusha? In what sense was it a drusha that's uniquely yours, that nobody else could have just delivered it from the same piece of paper as well? And when you put a little bit of yourself into the drusha in some way or another, again, that serves that means of, of connecting. You're connecting with people and they're feeling connected to you. There are times when I'll quote like a, a silly personal anecdote um, about, about anything going on in life, about, uh, I don't know, the difficulties with... Uh, an IT problem on your computer, or, or again, just a silly anecdote that I'll quote on the side as a means towards highlighting a larger lesson. And people will come over to you afterwards and say, oh, Rabbi, let me tell you about the time that I had a problem with my computer, or, um, or you know, the problem, the time that I was searching for a parking spot, or whatever the case may be, you have these, these side anecdotes that, um, that serve as a means of letting people know who you are, they feel connected to you, and then they feel inclined to share with you as well, to like open up a little bit about their world when, when they're connected. It, it impacts the content that you share. My content is very often crafted by what happens to be resonating with me at any particular moment. And I don't even do that consciously. Very often I, I sit down to prepare a drusha. To me, it's critical for Abunim that they make sure that their drusha preparation time is learning time. Sometimes you can be so narrowly focused on the task of preparing a drusha, you can spend an hour and maybe you come up with a good conclusion, maybe you don't, but you haven't really learned anything. To me, it, it's critical that you make your drusher preparation time learning time as well. So that in addition to your, to your drusher preparation, you come away with something personally. You have some element of personal growth through the, the, the Torah learning. But lots of times I'll sit down and I'll open up the Parsha and I'll find a source that, that and I craft a, per, a personal message, you know, that, that 
derives from, from that particular source. And very often, retrospectively, I realized that I found that message because that happens to be what is going through my mind at any particular moment. That's what my soul is wrestling with at that particular moment. That's what's going through my heart. And the message that I'm sharing is, is almost a direct outgrowth of my lived experiences. But that too, I think, is an important connection point. It's, it, you could always deliver, like I said before, a sterile to our Torah. But when you're speaking to what you're feeling, people can sense that. People can tell that it's real for you, that it's genuine for you. I think it's also important to think about what, what other people are going through if our goal is connection. You might have goals in terms of messages that you want people to internalize. And, and I have my share. When I, when I have a message that I want to, um, to communicate, a muster message, a point, I'll just jot it down and I'll wait for the right week when I feel like it's appropriate to deliver that message. But week to week, I really try to speak to, to whatever degree possible, what, what people are thinking about, what, what they're going through. It's been particularly acute over, over the last four months, for sure. I've said that as much as ordinarily, I really try to think about my drusha ideas, the idea itself, the content, um, in advance, as far in advance as possible, sometimes weeks in advance. These past four months, I have deliberately not been thinking about my drusha message until earliest Wednesday night. Because the world has been moving so rapidly, things have been changing so much. I don't know what's going to be on people's minds on Thursday, if it's only Monday. Um, and in the few instances where I have tried to prepare in advance, I ended up changing it on Wednesday night because of some events that happened over the course of the week. And again, obviously, these few months, so much has been happening that that really just are are impacting all of us. Um, I, I've I've recrafted it then to try to speak to what people are experiencing, what they're going through. So those are, again, I guess some of the elements. I'll just give you one more element of connection that I think is important, too. Yeah. Um, which goes to the connection of like the, the question of of scripting your dress shows and things like that. So person, there, there are a lot of different approaches to this. And I think every rabbi needs to know what works for them and what doesn't. But when I'm giving a drasha, I almost never use notes. Or if I'm using notes, I use only very, very basic notes. I'll have the source printed, really bare bones material. Um, because when I'm giving a drasha, I want to be connecting with my people. And in order to connect, you need to be talking to them, not talking at them. In other speeches that I give, like when I give a Hespid, Rahman al I have it all scripted and I read it straight from a script. There, my goal is not connection. There, my goal is to share something meaningful about the, the Niftar, the Niftares, to say something meaningful for the family, etc. cetera. Um, but I'm not trying to per interpersonally connect in the same way. And in that instance, I will just read straight from a script. But when I'm giving a drasha and I have that connection piece in mind, I will, I will forego the script. Sometimes that means I leave out a great formulation that I had prepared and I get frustrated with myself afterwards. But the price that you pay there, I think you, you gain tenfold in terms of the connection that you're able to forge. Yeah. It's so interesting to, to me to hear you say that because uh, in the interim uh, situation that I was in, I found myself having to give a few hespedim. And I was very much uh, of the mindset, like you're saying, of, of the connection, of being present with, with the Kahila. And, and it seemed awkward to do that at the, at the Levaya. It, it just it didn't seem right. I was looking at these people whose, whose relative had passed away that I didn't really know the person very well. I didn't know the relative very well. And it just it seemed awkward to connect. So I anchored myself to the text. And it, it just felt more natural, actually, to to not connect at that time and just to 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 put the spotlight on, on the mace, you know, through through the eulogy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's a different kind of speech. It's a very different kind of setting, and it's a very different tone. I, I think this applies to drushos also. I, I always tell young Rabbanim that that if you're using the same exact formula every single week, then there's something wrong. There there are different the drusha that you give before Yizker is going to be different than the drusha that you give, let's say, in more of a Purim festive atmosphere. That, that They have to be different. Um, but I think you're 100% right. When it comes to a Hespid, my approach is, is different. There, I'm really focused on the content of saying something meaningful. Hopefully, again, certain certain underlying themes are the same. You want to still emotionally connect, that's for sure. You know, And obviously, the emotional piece is critical at, at, in a Hespid. But in terms of like the the conversational, joking around, connecting with people, that, that I'm obviously not doing. In, in a Hesped context, and it does dramatically impact the way I speak and the way I deliver. Yeah. I also found it interesting that you said that, you know, a, a, a component, maybe let's say a, a third of, of your goal for the Josh is to connect with people. 
is these are people that that they're your kahila that you're not a stranger to them and they're not a stranger to you yet that that uh, consistency that you know that continual deposit of you know make another connection another connection another connection it compounds over time and um yeah I think that's 100% correct. Um, I'll say a few things in terms of in terms of what you just said. So first of all, in terms of like a third, I wouldn't say that every drusha is one third, one third, one third. You know, some drushas focus more on one than on another. Like in a broad, if we're looking at things in a macro sense, yeah, I think all teaching, inspiring, connecting, all three of those things are, are critical. But I will definitely shift depending on what's happening and, and what I want to convey and some drugs right. will be more heavy in terms of Torah content. Others will be more focused on a message. There, there's, you know, it's not like every single drusha is broken down. Right. Average. In way. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and then in terms of the the connection piece that that you're describing, I think you're you're also again describing that quite accurately. Uh, Rabbi Hain once said to me that he feels like his drusha is a weekly conversation that went on for for decades between him and his people. And, and I like to think of things that way also. Uh, in my personal context, I'm, I'm also the rabbi of a very large shul. So I don't have personal touch points with every one of my congregants every single week. I think creating those personal touch points outside the drasha is critical. It's probably a little bit beyond our scope for this podcast, but I, I do strive quite actively to find ways to create those small touch points outside of the drasha with as many congregants as I can. And you'd be surprised by how far just a small two minute conversation can go. Um, but again, that, that's a broader rabbinic piece. In terms of the drusha itself, yeah, it, it is that weekly conversation that's happening between you and your congregants. And, and it's a conversation where they're given an opportunity to respond. They're obviously not responding in the moment. They're not, they're not, uh, they're not offering their rebuttals from the pulpit after you speak. But when you're effective, they will come over to you during the Kiddush or just after davening. And like I said, they'll offer their thoughts or they'll offer just a personal story about them. That, that's unsolicited, but it's almost a natural, it, it evokes, it naturally evokes that response when you set that kind of tone that's rooted in conversation, connection, and building that relationship. Yeah. So I'm curious, I, I read that, uh, at, at, I think it was your, maybe at your installation weekend. So you have six minyanim. And you went from minion to minion to minion to to deliver the drush and to kind of get a feel for the culture of every one of those minyanim. And so so describe to me the culture of the different minyanim and, and how you know how often you touch them uh, with your drushas and and what cultures uh, you know emerge from that and uh, how that. So how you, that is. you may not even realize how potentially political a question you're asking is. I can get myself <laughs> in trouble by uh, by trying to characterize all of our different minyanim. <laughs> I won't I won't try to like characterize each one individually. I, I will yep. say a few things. Number one, each one certainly has its own flavor. Each one certainly has its own flavor. Uh, my tone is certainly more formal in some minyanim than others. Um, in some minyanim, I'll focus more in terms of those different components that I told you we're trying to balance. I'll focus more on some rather than others, depending on the different minyanim. When I speak in multiple minyanim, it's always the same basic drasha, but the nuances will differ. The nuances will change depending on the particular tone and flavor of that minion. There are weeks when I feel like there's a message that's important that I want to get out, and I will go to every single one. I will speak in every single minion. Certainly, again, over the last four months, there have been several occasions where I think it was important that everybody hear something. So I would I would really run from minion to minion. It doesn't really serve my own personal davening very well, but but that's a way of of you know getting the message out. Um, I do think the basic premise of your question is 100% correct. Uh, a rabbi needs to understand the different nuances of each crowd. You need to understand your audience and you need to, you need to craft your message accordingly. I'll just give you one like very broad example. I, I like to tell younger rabbanim that, that your drusha can never be bigger than the room. Your drusha can never be bigger than the room. If you have a small intimate crowd and you start getting up and delivering this bombastic drusha as if you are you know, Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb himself, and you start, you start with this very formal style and it, it just, there, there's a mismatch between the atmosphere that you're in and the style of drusha that you're giving. Um, you could still speak eloquently and articulately, and you should, but you need to just match your rhetorical delivery to, to the room that you're in. So we have a main minion that seats hundreds of people every single Shabbos. 
We have a Hashkama minion that's smaller, but also significant. We have a Svaradi minion, which is, which is much, much smaller. So you just need to make sure that you're sensitive to the differences of your audiences, of the different settings, to make sure that you're delivering appropriately. Yeah, interesting. So um, tell me a little bit about your process. So today's Wednesday. And so where, where are we in the process? Okay, so it happens to be I'm actually not delivering a drush this week. We have a scholar in residence, so uh, so that makes things a little bit easier. Um, okay. And I, um, sorry, I, 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 I said Wednesday. It's really Thursday. It's a Thursday already. Correct. Yes, it's Thursday afternoon. So, and I also told you that that it will sometimes depend. Like my my method over the last few months has been different than it ordinarily is, given everything that's going on overseas and the fact the way that's been impacting our emotional experiences, our religious experiences, quite profoundly. Um, we've also had, you know, I'm here in Teaneck. We've unfortunately had some some bad anti-Semitism here in Teaneck. So I've really been been holding off. Like I said, earliest Wednesday night, have I even been thinking about what I want to say Shabbos morning? Um, in ordinary times, um, the, the the method is very different. I usually like to have an idea far in advance because I find that the longer I let an idea simmer and percolate, the the more effective it is. So, so even if I'm um, looking at a drush a few weeks out, and I'm certainly not thinking about what exactly I'm going to say, if I have a general sense of where I'm going, I'll find that your mind naturally builds connections, you find other pieces, and the product will be much better the longer you let that idea sit. Um, so, so the idea itself, you want to be sitting for as long as possible. And then there are two subsequent stages to me. Then there's taking the idea and crafting it. In other words, here is the way I want to present it. And then there's the actual rehearsal for your presentation. So I'd say that that already by, by Wednesday night, certainly Thursday, you want to be working on stage two. And then I'd say like, you know, Friday, Friday night, Shabbos morning, you're working on rehearsal. I find also that no matter how much I have rehearsed a drusha, Unless I go over it at least once on Shabbos morning, it will not be sharp. Um, before I was a rabbi, I was a Baal Kriya. And, and I find it's very similar in some ways. You're delivering, there, there again, there are cadences, there are there are words that you need to master. You, you can master a Parsha and laning in the Tikkun, but if you don't review it Shabbos morning, it's not going to be sharp. Um, I find for myself that even if I have rehearsed something extensively, if I don't do at least one run, on Shabbos morning, it will impact the presentation. Hey there, fellow podcast listeners. There's a secret that great public speakers know. Did you know there's a method for cutting straight through to an audience's heart, grabbing their attention and holding it, and making a memorable impact with your presentation? The best speakers in the world utilize it. And now you can too, every time you get up to speak. Download your free Magid Method of Public Speaking template at magidmethod.com. M-A-G-G-I-D-M-E-T-H-O-D dot com. The Magid Method will teach you how to find your authentic voice, craft meaningful presentations, manage people's attention, and build unbreakable bonds with your audience. Go to MagidMethod.com and download your free copy now. Now let's get back to the program. What are you trying to achieve with that rehearsal? Are you trying to memorize it? Are you trying to get down a couple of phrases so that you have that mouth memory so that they come out fluid? So like, what, what what's the goal of the rehearsal? That's a good question too. So I, I will say for me, a rehearsal... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Daniel, do you have something I, else to add? I know you're a student uh, of Rabbi Glasser. So Rabbi Glasser puts in an, an enormous amount of time rehearsing. So I, yeah, I, I want to... So, yeah. so Rabbi Glasser and I have discussed this a lot. He, um, yes, he does enormous rehearsals and he does way more, I will say, he does way more than I do in terms of rehearsal. Like... I don't know how much I'm allowed to say, but I know that he he does like real rehearsals um, in some instances. For me, a rehearsal, I don't mean that I like get up and, and deliver the speech. I, I review it. I review it to myself mostly. Again, my kids don't hear me rehearsing the, uh, the drusha. Um, but for me, the goal is not memorization so much. Um, if, or if I could give you an annoying answer. Less than memorization, but more than just turns of phrase. Um, I find that if I try to memorize the full script, that holds me back. Because then you're just, if you make a slight mistake, you feel, oh, that, that doesn't work for me either. I do craft way more than just turns of phrase. And what I find is, once I get up there, I, I literally have a moment where I tell myself that, that I am entrusting myself to just deliver this as best I can. In other words, I'm, not, I'm no longer trying to 
stick to the script. If I do, I can't get any words out. I'm entrusting myself to deliver it properly. And it's always different from the script itself. Even in the morning when I'm giving drushes of multiple minyanim, aside from the conscious changes, even just delivery, things will change from one delivery to the next. Because like I said before, if you're trying to talk to people, it, you never tell the story exactly the same way twice. But um, I am trying to get the basic um, structure, certainly lots of lots of the turns of phrase. I, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's way more than just turns of phrase. You're really trying to get the script of the drusha down while giving yourself a license to deviate from that script and improvise as needed. Yeah, I, I think I've heard it referred to as, as setting setting the drusha. You're, setting you're, the drusha, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, uh, on a Shabbos where you're speaking to, let's say, all the minyanim, or, or even the majority of them, um, which one's the best? Is it the first one? Is it the last one? Is it, you know, the, is it the energy of the first time you're giving it? Or is it the polish and refinement or the, the absorption uh, of the last one? It's a great question. It's funny you ask. Um, and again, it's hard to give a straight answer to that also. I'll say a few things. Number one, there are times when different drushos um, have different elements and different parts are better in different places. So just like referencing what, what you were saying a moment ago, like there are times when, when you're giving a drusha that's emotionally charged. Um, either you're sharing something personal Certainly over the last few months, um, a lot about Eretz Yisrael. I happen to be a really emotional person. I joke about this from the pulpit. I'm a total sap. I'm like I'm, I'm a big crier. Um, and there are times when I get like choked up at the pulpit when I'm talking about particularly, again, these last few months, I can't even count how many times um, I've been, I've had to stop in the middle of a story to kind of complete it. Um, is that better or worse? From a speaking standpoint, that's a lot worse. You want to maintain your composure. But sometimes people appreciate the genuineness that comes with it also. So usually the first time I'm going to be way more emotional than I am the third time, right? When you've spoken about it three times, it's usually not going to hit you the same way. Again, being an emotional person, there are times, and this has happened to me, when different parts of my drusha have hit me in different times, I've, different times I've delivered it. So, so the first time I got very emotional while telling this part of the story, and, and the third time I got emotional telling a different part of the story. That's happened to me too. And sometimes I guess that's just the living dynamic of the drusha where different parts come alive in different instances. But but yeah, so so it's hard to answer which one is better, which one is worse, that they're, they're different in that regard. In terms of polish, yes, usually it will be more polished the third time you're giving it than the second time if you're self-critical, which I'm, I'm heavily self-critical. After each time you're asking yourself, okay, which parts could have been better? And you're refining and you're tweaking. So usually, yes, it will be more refined when you've given it the second or third time then the first time, it won't necessarily have the same emotional charge. And going back to what I was telling you before, also, different minyanim have different styles, some of which are, are more suited to me. When I speak in the main minyan, it's more formal. It's usually slower. The same drasha will take me a few minutes longer in the main minyan, even if it's the same script. It will take me a few minutes longer because of that more formal setting. Um, and that also, I think I usually deliver better in, in that setting, maybe precisely because it's, it's slower um, than I will in other minyanim. But there's no objective answer that applies every single week. Yeah. So I want to ask you a question. Uh, your predecessor, uh, Rabbi Przansky, mm -hmm. uh, was for a long time. And uh, and then you come on the scene a couple of years ago, uh, you know, a young guy. Um, how did you how did you achieve the buy in with with, with the Kila? You know, uh, they, they had someone, you know, older, revered. Uh, you know, how did you build the trust, credibility with them? Um, and how did the drusha play a part in that? Right. So that, that's that's a really multifaceted question. Um, and the drusha is only one really small part of that, I would say. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if we're focusing on the drusha, I, I'd say it's a few things. Number one, um, I do think the community had certain areas of continuity between myself and Rabbi Brzezanski. Rabbi Brzezanski was a master wordsmith is not was, um, but certainly when he was here, if you've ever listened to him speak his his formulations, his um, he's just a, a master. Um, his rhetoric is just masterful. He, he really is. It's just quite impressive. Every time I listen to him, I pick up something again, whether it be a turn of phrase or, or a style or something like that. Um, I do not place myself on his level at all, but to whatever degree I was able to provide that, I'm a bit of a wordsmith myself, and to whatever degree I was able to provide that, I think that created some feeling of, of continuity. 
Um, and I think that was a big piece of it. I think the focus on connection that I've been highlighting throughout was a big piece of it as well. When people feel like they know you and they have a piece of you and you have a relationship with them, then yeah, it's never going to be the same as the rabbi that was in the shul for 26 years. But at least we know this new kid or this new rabbi and, and we're building a relationship. And I think that was a palpable feeling and still is, I think, for many of us. But certainly in the early stages, there was a palpable feeling that we're building something here, that we're building a relationship here. And I think mm-hmm. that also went to really, and, and as, as I said before, the drush was only one small piece of that. Sure. But I think it was a meaningful piece of that. And when you were able to put the whole package together, it was a recognition. I never professed to say that, oh, everything's going to be fine because your spiritual leader and mentor for, for a quarter century is going on and I'm going to take his place. I was very open about the fact that it's not going to be the same. But I was also open about the fact that we're looking to build something new. And I think I got a lot of buy-in on that. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, so you mentioned that you uh, you share some uh, personality, some par- parts of yourself to, as a means to connect with the Kila. Uh, to what extent? That's a great question also. And I think there's there's also a, uh, a much larger tension there within the rabbinate um, on several levels. First, there's almost like a, a hashkafic tension with um, how much you want to share. The Navi tells us, right? Uh, on one level, you want to, you don't want to be sharing things gratuitously. I'm a Talmud of Michal Rosenzweig. He's, he's my Rebbe Mufak Mori Rabbi. He's a very private person. He's not, he's not looking to gratuitously flaunt elements of his life. Um, and that's something that I think is, is an inherent tension of maintaining privacy, but also wanting to share parts of yourself with people so that they, um, so that they do feel connected. Because in any relationship, if you if you're if you never make yourself vulnerable, if you never share anything, that's not that's not a true relationship. That's one tension. Number two, you have to be very careful to make sure that it's not about you. I, I think certainly in in an old school rabbinic context, you'd sometimes hear rabbis that would talk about themselves, which to me is, is really one of the worst things that a rabbi can do. In other words, if, if the topic, the content is about you as opposed to just a means towards forging a connection or making a point or delivering a message. I think that that's really problematic. So example of that, I'm not exactly clear what you're referring to. Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily have particular examples, but, but when, when a drusha sounds like a rabbi is, is kind of reciting a resume or, or talking about experiences that they've done, things that they have, it, it can sound boastful at times. It can sound like a personal um, ego trip. And that to me is extraordinarily distasteful. I think it's one of the worst things a rabbi can do. So I think that you need to very, very carefully avoid. Um, I, I mean, again, talking about like his day or his job or his or his. No, I, again, I, I I'm almost hesitant to go into examples. Um, okay. But but yeah, I think I think you just don't. It's a classic skill they teach young rabbi. I'm like, don't make it about you. It's not about you. And again, I think. Thankfully, you see a lot less of that nowadays than perhaps you did a generation or two generations ago. But I've seen it, and it's it's ugly. Um, okay. But in terms of myself, like it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a balance. It's a bit of a balance. It's it's um. I will again certain silly things. I'm I'm very happy to share. Like I said, the story about uh, when my computer broke, and I'll, I'll often engage in self deprecating humor about how I don't really understand these things and things like that. That, that I'll share because it's, it's a triviality. Now, those trivialities, I think, in terms of building a relationship can be significant because it's a touch point. Um, but that I'll openly share. When it comes to broader things, you you have to strike a balance. And it's it's not always um, it's not always a simple balance. I, I could tell you there was one instance where I shared a story about a conversation between myself and my son. Um, and the youth, some of the youth directors in Shul had heard my drasha. And during groups that day, they made a comment to him about the conversation without any ill intent whatsoever. They were kind of just referencing it. And my son was really upset by that. He was really, he was really not happy with it. And that was a moment of recalibration for me. I need to be much more careful about what I share about my kids. Again, I wasn't talking about my kids. It was a a conversation between the two of us, but it means I need to be more thoughtful and I need to be way more careful about that. Um, other things you could be much more open about. I've, I've been very emotionally raw, as I referenced before, these past few months. I, I'd done two trips to Israel since October 7th. 
And in each instance, I spoke about some of my personal experiences and my personal reactions to them in a way that was very open and very raw. Um, that I think is, is less of a privacy concern. So there I was, I was much more open about it, but in general, I can't tell you, I have any principles or, or rules. I will say that it's a calculus that I think a rabbi needs to be very, very thoughtful about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talk to me about structure a little bit. How, how do you structure your drushes? Um, structure is a great question. And I, um, I also don't stick to a single structure every single week. I, I can offer some broad structural principles, but I do think they change based on, on the drusha that you're giving. So number one, like I told you, my, my ideal, my lechatrilo for an opener is when I can open in a way that feels conversational, that that's almost inviting people into the drusha in a way that's very personal, um, not too formal, that, that really just serves to, to connect. Um, I do feel like in the current, um, environment, certainly in my shul, you need to have something outside of just your, your Torah piece, some study, interest piece, so, something that's there. I will usually try to throw that in somewhere in the middle of a drusha. I think that conventional wisdom says you use that as a hook at the beginning. But I find the flaw with the hook theory is that people, if they know it's coming, they'll listen to that at the beginning. And then they'll just, they know, once the rabbi transitions to Torah, then I'm out uh, and I'm not interested anymore. So I will, um, I will deliberately put those pieces interspersed between my Torah messages or something like that. But sometimes it creates what I call a snapback moment when you've lost some of your crowd. And of course, every rabbi, when you're delivering, you have to be attentive to your audience and, and learn whatever messages they're projecting to you uh, just through, through listening. So you have a snapback moment where you're delivering a Torah idea. And then you'll say, you know, I saw an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal the other week. And all of a sudden, you'll have a bunch of people who were, who were not attentive. And they hear that. And all of a sudden, they're, they're back to attention. And the hope is that once you transition back to a Torah piece, you're able to retain that attention afterwards. So if I have interest pieces, I prefer to intersperse them in the middle to create this, this balance, this ebb and flow of the drusha and give people an opportunity to refocus if they, if they lost focus uh, beforehand. But not every drusha is like that. Um, certainly when I give uh, more what you'd call musari drushas, and we can talk about giving musar and drushas as well. I think there's a lot to be said about that too. Um, a lot of times I will structure it entirely differently. I, I will A, forecast what I'm about to talk about. I'll say, I think this Shabbos, we need to have a frank conversation about talking during shul. So that already, everybody's, everybody knows that something's coming. The rabbi is ready to tell us something. Then I'll usually deliver a Torah piece. I won't go directly into the Torah piece. I want them to know that it's coming. I, I want to telegraph where it's going. So I'll tell them, you know, we need to talk about talking during shul. I'll offer a Torah piece. And then I'll spend the entire rest of the drusha talking about whatever issue is on my mind. Um, and again, you'll speak about different facets of it. You'll, you'll develop it. And it needs to be done the right way. But if it is, that's usually how I'll do that. So that's an entirely different structure. But that, that's what serves me well more when I'm giving what I would call more of a Musser style drusha. Um, and, and there could be anything in between. I think you gotta be flexible. If you, if you have the same structure every single time, I think that detracts. You, you always wanna have some measure of, of flexibility. Yeah, and, and the closing I find for people is, is very difficult. People have a hard time landing yes. the plane. And so how do you approach the close? Do, do, you, do you work backwards? Do you, where do you find the close? Or do, does it sometimes it just comes to you at the end? How, how does right. it work with? So it's, no, I think closing is one of the most important things to prepare. And if ever I'm limited on time, that's one of the things that I have to, I, that I will focus on first. Um, because you could fill in the middle, but, but the ending, A, it's a very important moment. People remember how you close. And it's also, like you said, it's difficult. It's not easy. Um, so much so that even when I'm giving a quick bar halacha between Mencha and Marev, not, not on Shabbos, let's say on a weekday, five minutes, um, I, I'm not crafting every line of that Tvar Halacha, but I will try to think about what my closing line is going to be. Um, that's, that's often, I think, if, you, if you're limited on time, that's sometimes the most important thing to think about. And it's funny that you use the language of landing the plane. That's a language that Rabbi J.J. Shachter likes to use, um, yeah. and that Rabbi Kenny Hain likes to use as well. You know, sometimes you just keep circling and circling and circling until you crash land, Mashiach said, Kingdom of Amen, Amen. Amen. Right? Like, <laughs> that's, that's just, you know, everybody's crash landing is, uh, is Mashiach said, Kingdom. Or you run out of gas. <laughs> Sorry? Or you run out of gas. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And you just you just have to bring it down. 
Um, I would say that I, I think I'm most effective. I like to create a coda in my closing. I, I like to use my closing as an opportunity to reference back all of the pieces from the beginning through the end. Um, so I'll often use the rule of threes when it comes to a closing. That's a classic rhetorical technique where you'll give three examples. Um, and it's not a strict three. Sometimes it could be more or less if it's crafted the right way. But but I will use a charge at the end of the drusha that references every piece. You know, start goes back to the Tvar Torah. Um, let's follow the example of Yisro HaKohen. Let's, uh, you know, and then it will reference whatever study I quoted. Let's make sure we are doing X as opposed to what, whatever the case may be, whatever the, the particular structure is, I'll try to use the, the ending as a coda that kind of ties, ties it all together. Yeah. That sounds a little bit like, uh, reminds me of Pesach Krohn. Rabbi Pesach Krohn does that. I think at the end, he always tries to remind people of what he talked about in, in the messages that right. emerged. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And you don't want to necessarily do it in a heavy handed or overt way. It's not like, you know, we're, it's not like a sheer where, Oh, just to review right. You just want to like, tie it in subtly to to everything that you're that you're trying to communicate and convey yeah i have a question this is a question that comes up from time to time talking about uh, using ai to craft sermons uh, and i'm curious what your thoughts are on that on that okay so that's obviously like a really new uh topic um and people have like crafted drusha people will talk about like having um chat gpt write a drusha for you so like I, I look I I don't I've never I haven't been so impressed look I've been very impressed with AI I don't mean to take away <laughs> anything from the AI it's amazing unbelievable technology from a drusha standpoint it's obviously still quite limited um, I, I'm not here to rule out the possibility that ten or fifteen years from now they'll be able to craft drushas better than we will I, I think it's still quite limited from from a drusha standpoint um, it certainly does not include the personal elements that I've been talking about right if part of it is connection. No AI generated drusha is going to be able to create that for you. That that certainly is going to be lacking. Where I do find I've started using AI and where I do find it helpful is in finding pieces for a drusha. If I have a particular message, the importance of setting goals in spiritual life, I'll go to ChatGPT and I'll say, hey, can you reference some, I don't know, studies on the psychological impact that setting goals has on, on people's success and failure and things like that? And sometimes it'll give me something valuable, sometimes not. Sometimes I have to ask a few follow-up questions. But it has been very helpful as, as a search engine, in other words, in, in terms of a more effective Google, in terms of finding content to plug into Drushos. There I have found it to be a very useful tool. Yeah. So uh, I was speaking to Rabbi Chaim Strauchler this week. Mm -hmm. uh, Abraham. Yeah. yeah. So, so he... he asked me something he, he, he just said this is something that you should ask other rabbis and i want to start incorporating into my interview and he said uh he said imagine that you have uh you know it's after 120 and you have the opportunity to give a drusha to the yeshiva shomayla you know you're looking back over the span of your career uh i know you're, you're mid-career but uh but uh you know what what are the messages what are the themes that you keep on coming back to that that you would expect that if you had to give a drusha you know that that's going to follow uh a certain theme so you're asking like like uh, what themes or what content would I be delivering? It's, yeah. it's such an interesting question. It's a great question. I am always asked very penetrating, thoughtful <laughs> questions. Um, Who hi you know, Like what 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 do you represent? You know. What, yeah, what's th this is no exception. I'd say that for me, it's only hard to answer because, like I told you before, a lot of times it it really is dependent on where I am spiritually at any given moment. It's very much a response to my own spiritual persona. Like if you'd ask me that question right now, my themes are Am Yisrael, advancing Jewish history, being a part of the saga of Jewish history, uh, appreciating peoplehood, right? Because those are the themes that are on all our minds right now, and I'm certainly no exception. Um, at other moments, it's the the privilege of forging a personal relationship with, with God and how we sometimes take that for granted and, and appreciating the blessings that Jewish life has and the beauty of Jewish life and the power and the majesty of it, right? There could be any number of themes at, at any given moment. I usually do find that if you take my drushers over, let's say any six month span, you'll find some theme that, that motivates many of them. But, um, but I think those themes themselves in any given six month period are very much responsive to my own spiritual journey in life. We all have one. So I think it's hard to identify one that, 
that crystallizes everything. But I do think in any given, like I said, chunk of time, you could certainly find messages that are the dominant themes. Yeah. Um, I just have two last questions because I know your time is valuable. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, attention spans, uh, ha how you manage uh, people's attention spans. Uh, obviously, there's, you know, you're intentional about how you sprinkle the, the hooks and things like that throughout your, your drasha. But, uh, but, you know, people's, people are distracted. People's attention spans are down. It, you know, ha how do you how do you approach that when you get up there? Right. So I think a lot of the um, the techniques that I mentioned before that you referenced a moment ago are um, are very important for maintaining attention spans. Um, look, it's a problem that we all face. It's a problem that we all face. I think it is a little easier on Shabbos when people don't have devices that are distracting them. So you get a little bit more leeway there. And I think when you're crafting, you have to be very, very mindful of it. I find that, again, the, the structural pieces that we spoke about are a big piece of keeping people's attention. I think the the formulations, the if I think are a big piece of keeping people's attention as well. When you when you have a poetic quality to your prose, I think it does hold people's attention for longer. It doesn't come off as a, as a stale message. It's it's interesting. It's a it's a different way of formulating things. And people are again whether they can articulate it or not, they're drawn to the formulations. And the more you are successful in connecting, you'll be able to draw people's attention as well. If indeed it feels conversant at the beginning, we, we, most of us are still able to have conversations, to hold conversations with other human beings. Who knows if the next generation will still be capable of doing so, but most of us still can. And if you're succeeding in doing that as well, you'll be able to, to hold for longer because it's not just, I'm not just listening to you speak. Like I said before, I'm not listening to you speak at me, but I'm, I'm hearing you speak to me. And I think that's also a very effective piece of, of holding people's attention. Yeah. Uh, okay. And the last question is uh, two pieces of advice that you have to give to a new uh, a rabbi who's embarking on a speaking career uh, to set him up for success. The two most uh, important things that you'd want him to know. Uh, <laughs> uh, beyond everything we've spoken about to this point. Or, or it could be, it could incorporate some of the, the things that you, you already mentioned. Yeah, look, again, obviously, I think I think a lot of the themes that we've been talking about are obviously critical, critical pieces. Um, but I, I guess, and this might be a cheap answer, but I'd say the two most important things that you have to know are you have to know yourself and you have to know your audience. Those are the two most important things that you have to know. First, you have to you have to know your own voice. You have to know your own voice. And if you're just trying to parrot or mimic another speaker, even a great speaker, a speaker that you greatly admire, you're not going to succeed. You need to find your own voice. Like I said before, I said, I told you before that whenever I listen to another rabbinic speaker, I'm always listening on two planes. You know, what, what can I incorporate? What can I not? There are times when I will listen to a speaker and say, this feature of what they did was absolutely masterful. And I am never, ever going to do it. It was fantastic. It just doesn't match my voice. I would never be able to pull it off. And, and it, it would just be artificial if I tried to do it. As much as I admire it in somebody else, I know that personally it won't work. So you need to know who you are, what your voice is, what your messages are, what you're trying to convey. If you don't understand who you are, you're never going to be able to inspire others. That's key. And number two, you need to understand your audience. You need to understand where they're at, what, what's on their mind. What are the spiritual battles that they're going through? What are the spiritual struggles they're experiencing? What are the experiential, emotional, psychological features of their lives that you need to be speaking to, that you need to be tending to as, as their rub? Hopefully, in, in an ideal circumstance, who you are and who they are will, will mesh sufficiently that you can speak to them and also inspire them. You don't want it to be, you don't want to have a disconnect. And of course, you don't want to be in a place where you're incapable of inspiring growth and, and moving them forward. But hopefully in an ideal scenario, there is that overlap between between the voice that's in you and and what you're learning from them and what you're communicating to them. But I think I think that's critical. Um, I think it's always been critical. It's particularly critical now in the world where we live in, where people just for content, they can just access the Internet and and access any content that they want. Um, so to be able to to understand yourself, understand them and create the dialogue between them and the connection between the two, I think is probably the most, the most important thing before that, that precedes really any of the techniques or themes or even goals. You have to understand those two basic pieces before moving forward.
Right. Amazing. And I, I would imagine a lot of that comes off the pulpit, right? It, it's, it's touching people pastorally learning about them. Yeah. And then- yeah. It's all integrated. It's all integrated in the end of the day, but yeah, it's, it's understanding them. It's understanding yourself. I, I think it's critical. I mean, if we're talking about the broader piece of, of knowing yourself, I think it's critical for rabbis to keep growing. I think it's essential. You can't view yourself as having grown when you're in yeshiva or when you're in smicha. And now, okay, now you're just going to sit on that repository of knowledge that you built or maybe enhance it a little bit and just deliver that. I think you can't lose the the yeshiva buffer, if you will, that's inside of you, that's always aspiring to grow and push and, and learn more. I think that's that's a critical part of knowing yourself. And in terms of knowing them, yeah, you're 100% right. That's the holistic picture. It comes through the small conversations that you have. It, co- it comes through the life cycle moments, the joyous moments, the the more challenging moments. It comes through um, the moments they sit in your office for pastoral guidance. Um, I mentioned to you before, again, this is not our, our narrow topic. I call people on their yard sites. I call people on their yard sites. It's, um, it's incredibly time consuming. I have a very large shul, but it, those small conversations, you, you learn so much and you forge a relationship through them and um, you're doing all of those other things you're able to connect with them in the drusha in a more meaningful way as well. Amazing. Thank you so much. You've been listening to The Magid Method, and I'm Daniel Steinberg. Learn more about The Magid Method at M-A-G-G-I-D-M-E-T-H-O-D.com, magidmethod.com. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.